Applications fail all the time. Same holds true for your microservices. And the chances of failure is the highest whenever you deploy a new version of your app. Let's see how we can fix that. Hey guys, it's me, your tech bar, and in this video, we'll see why you need to start practicing Canary deployments. We'll begin by discussing why Canary deployments is so important. We'll then check out some tools which can assist us to implement it. Traditionally, we have been using the rollout strategy for releasing new versions of our microservices. In such a strategy, we start a new copy of the new version, then shut down an older copy of the previous version. We keep doing this until all the old copies have been replaced by the new ones. And there could be a number of rules governing this. Like instead of rotating the copies one at a time, you can batch them up or you can do it all at once. And it doesn't end here. You can also set the max extra copies you want to allow or the minimum healthy or running copies you want to maintain. Clearly, it's pretty flexible. No wonder it's been around for so long. The major problem with this approach is that rollouts usually just check if the new copy has started or not. They don't really get into testing for bugs or performance lapses. It's like hopping into a shower without testing how hot the water is. Who does that? If you're a sane person, you'll first check the temperature with your fingers. You might as well use your toes. I won't judge. The point is, by doing that, we are minimizing the impact of our entire body getting burnt or really cold. So why not do the same with our microservices? To adapt the shower testing mechanism to our microservices, we'll need to take into account two fundamental components. First is the ability to control service exposure. I should be able to decide whether I want to dip my fingers or my toes. This is important since it limits the damage radius. What I mean is, when you go ahead and deploy a new version of your app and it happens to have bugs in it, you don't want all your end users to be affected by it. If you come from the world of RESTful APIs, this can be achieved by controlling incoming traffic. We can technically achieve this by running two Kubernetes deployments and have some kind of a router in front of them. Now we can forward just 5% of the total traffic to the new version. The existing version can continue serving the remaining requests. This way, even if our new version crashes or is really slow, only 5% of the total traffic will be impacted. Another way to do this would be to control what kind of users have access to the new version. Maybe I've got a bunch of alpha users or a QA team who wants to test the new features out before anyone else. In this case, we are limiting the impact of bugs to a specialized subgroup which kind of expects things to fail anyways, so the impact isn't that large. Now I know what you're thinking. Why do we need to complicate things and control traffic? Why can't we just spin up a QA environment and test things there? Well, we can do that, but it's going to be fairly expensive to maintain an extra environment which is identical to your production setup. In fact, I don't think that's even possible. Testing in a production environment with actual traffic and actual data is just not reproducible. You know what? Let me know your views on this in the comments below. Moreover, if you want to expose the services gradually over multiple stages, you will need some kind of a routing logic. Moving on, the second component we want to consider is analyzing or running tests against the new version. Just limiting exposure is not enough. We need a systematic process of reviewing and approving the new version. This process may be passive like simply monitoring the error rates for a couple of hours. Or it could be fairly active like firing some requests and observing the response. You can also decide what metrics you want to take into account. It could be monitoring error rates or some performance indicators like request latency or CPU utilization. It can also be as simple as seeing whether or not your app crashes. It's entirely up to you. And just to be clear, it doesn't always have to be an automated process. You can keep things completely manual or decide to mix things up a little. As I mentioned before, you can have as many stages as you want. You can choose to do some manual testing on the first stage for internal users only and choose to run complex automated tests for subsequent stages. No matter what method you choose, just make sure the process is consistent and that it's as exhaustive as possible. Hmm, that was kind of heavy, wasn't it? Now don't worry, Canary deployments is really easy to implement in Kubernetes. To control service exposure, you can choose a service mesh like Istio. 
If you remember from the previous video, you can configure routing rules in Istio to achieve all kinds of traffic distribution we discussed today. For example, you can easily split traffic between your canary and stable services based on a percentage. You can also split traffic based on a header or a JWT token claim to limit canary access to just a set of users. In both the examples, I'm assuming that there are three Kubernetes service objects present. One to globally identify all copies of our application. This will be used by all the other apps when they want to talk to us. The remaining two will be to identify the stable and canary copies respectively. We use this internally for obvious reasons. One thing to remember, you can achieve this level of traffic control by using an API gateway. But I prefer using Istio because it can control routing for service-to-service -service communication as well. It's pretty cool. Now for orchestrating the various analysis stages, you can use Argo rollouts. Argo Rollouts integrates amazingly well with Istio to automate the entire process of Canary deployments. Here's how you configure Canary deployments for a service using Argo Rollouts. You just need to create a rollout object. In its spec, you can specify anything which has to do with the deployment like the number of replicas and the pod template. You can then specify something called a strategy. In the context of Canary deployments, the strategy configures Argo rollouts to use our service objects that identify the Canary and stable copies of our application. We also need to provide the name of the Istio resource which controls the routing logic here. Whenever we deploy a new version of our app, Argo rollouts will go ahead and modify these routes to control how traffic is split across the Canary and stable replicas. Then finally, we can provide the steps or stages of our Canary deployment. Here, I'm starting with the 90-10 split which lasts indefinitely. If the Canary performs well, I can manually promote the app to the next stage which is a 50-50 split. This stage will last for 2 minutes. I can also run a background analysis job during these 2 minutes to check if the new version works as intended. Istio helps us here as well because it's already collecting a bunch of network metrics for us. In this example, Argo rollouts will query Prometheus to check the error rate of our Canary version. If the error rate is more than 5% or the success rate drop below 95%, the analysis will fail. Argo rollouts will auto roll back the new version if that happens. Argo rollout supports a decent number of integrations like Prometheus and AWS CloudWatch to run such analyses. The list is pretty exhaustive. Don't worry, I'll be going into the details of all we've covered today and make a practical guide in the subsequent video. This is probably a good time for you to subscribe. You know what? Let's live stream this. I would love to do things along with you. Drop in a comment if you find this idea interesting. The only downside of using Argo rollouts is that it can only split traffic based on a percentage. There are some ways around it, but it kind of feels like a hack. Apart from that, it's really amazing. Well. Canary deployments can greatly minimize the impact of bugs or misconfiguration. But in order for this to work, we'll have to find a mechanism to apply all these YAML files to Kubernetes. How do you do that? Well, check out this video to know more. Like, share and subscribe if you found this video to be helpful. And don't forget, I am your tech bot. You're on YouTube and hopefully in real life.